My name is Heather Alderman, and I am the Executive Director of COSMA. I'm here today with Dr. Damon Andrew from Florida State University. COSMA is conducting a series of interviews with sport management faculty who also hold administrative positions to get a sense of their personal stories, how they got there, and what it's like. So Dr. Andrew, welcome. It's good to see you. Um, I'd like you to introduce yourself and then let me know uh, what your titles are and we'll start talking. Okay. Um, as Heather said, I'm Damon Andrew. I'm the Dean of the College of Education at Florida State University. Uh, FSU is the oldest preeminent research university in Florida. Enrollment right now is a little bit over 45,000 students and the university is currently ranked 19th in the country among public universities. Uh, in the U.S. and then within Florida State University, the College of Education is actually the oldest education college in the state. It was originally founded in 1905 wow. and we serve about uh, actually over 2,300 students, uh, have about 113 full-time faculty, another 45 uh, full-time staff, and then the college itself is currently ranked number 18 in U.S. News and World Report rankings among public education colleges in the U.S., and uh, this is my fourth year as Dean of the College of Education here at FSU. Fantastic. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you got this position and maybe talk about positions that you've had, administrative positions that you've had um, coming up from being a faculty person? Sure. Um, so in all, this is actually my 24th year of work experience in higher education. Uh, 18 of those 24 years have included at least one administrative appointment uh, with 14 of those years being as a dean. So prior to coming to FSU, uh, I served as the dean of the College of Human Sciences and Education at Louisiana State University, uh, did that for five years. And prior to LSU, I had served as the dean of the College of Health and Human Services or Human Sciences at Troy University in Alabama for five years. Um, prior to Troy, I had served about four years total as a doctoral program director at the University of Tennessee and at the University of Louisville. Interesting. And how did you attain those positions? What kinds of preparation did you did you um, take to get those positions? Uh, yeah, I, I think that the as I moved into other deanships, having the the experience from the first deanship was very important. Right. Um, I did. I, I had gotten a call one day when I was at the University of Tennessee saying that I'd been nominated for a dean position at uh, Troy University and and actually thought it was one of my uh, doctoral program buddies from back when I was at Florida State here playing a joke on me, didn't realize it was somebody that was serious, but oh. I, I, I did, it wasn't until years later that I actually learned it was one of my former doctoral students at University of Louisville who had worked at Troy University for a couple of years before moving on to another institution. Um, but I guess it said a lot of things about me during his time there. And then as a result, I was on their radar mm -hmm. uh, to work there. And I probably, um, the opportunity at Troy was, uh, was unique. I, I was uh, 31 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so unusual to be in a deanship. And, and I had a lot to learn. And I learned a lot uh, yeah. uh, during those five years, particularly years one and two, and, and trying to figure out what is a dean does because I think as a faculty member you have one um, yes. picture in your mind and perspective of what a dean does and then once you actually get in the role uh, you realize it's very very different than what you you originally perceived it's not just showing up at uh, events and eating chicken dinners and things like that so it's uh, right um, that that was a very key experience for me I probably learned about 90 percent of what I needed to do to be an effective dean in my current job just based upon um, those years at Troy. Troy also, um, the dean's office staff was, well, when I got there, it was myself and a secretary. Uh, the secretary made minimum wage and was an hourly employee, had to clock in, clock out. So if she, um, if she worked every hour of, of every single day, for, uh, work day for the whole year, I think she earned about 19,000. Um, there were no associate deans, no assistant deans, no assessment coordinators, no marketing uh, and communications officers or anything like that. So wow. uh, I learned a lot about those jobs because I had to do them probably very poorly, but I had to do them. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result, when I moved on to larger institutions, um, then I was able to have a better idea of what all of those staff do and how they have to work together uh, for the common good of the college. 
So would you say, it sounds like, as you said, 90% of what you have learned to do, you learned on the job. What kind of preparation could somebody do if they wanted to attain that position? Or what do you wish, uh, preparation you wish you'd had uh, just to make it a smoother transition? Or is this impossible to explain or to prepare for? You know, it's interesting in higher education, I and mean, we teach a lot of things uh, um, about the importance of onboarding and preparation and, and, and so forth, but we don't do it real well sometimes when it comes to those administrative positions. Mm -hmm. I was not expecting the deanship at all. It kind of came uh, out of the blue for me, mm -hmm. and uh, so I had not even really started thinking about that aspect of it, but you know, after getting on the job, you know, if you go to the if you go to a website and Google, you know, books on how to be a dean and books on how to be a provost or how to be a president or, or higher education administration, you'll see that there are a number of books that have been written out there. Uh, not a ton of them, but there's enough of them that you can get a better idea of what the position is like. Um, I think that also uh, it would have been a real good idea. And, and I was, uh, I was uh, definitely benefited by having some mentors uh, in the field. I know working uh, at University of Louisville for my first uh, assistant professor position and having the opportunity to interact with Dan Mahoney, who's gone on to do a lot of great things in higher education administration, to always have somebody that you can pick up the phone and, and talk to. Uh, mm -hmm. That's been invaluable to me. And uh, so there are, there are also other, um, you know, I learned later that there were certificate programs in higher education administration that you could get. I've earned now two of them from Harvard University and one from Vanderbilt University. And mm -hmm. so um, I did most of my training after I moved into the position, but it certainly right. would have been a much smoother transition had I done some of that on the front front side. Of course, of course. And are there um, individuals who are not um, in these administrative positions that you work with or that you observe or get to talk to that you see has have that potential and so how do you approach, if it's faculty or, or someone else, how do you approach them to help mentor them or to give them um, an idea of what the job may entail? I've definitely seen throughout the years, uh, individuals that I've worked with that, that have the potential to do, to do more. And I think it's, um, it's real important too that, to understand the different types of administrative positions that you see in higher education. Um, probably the best way to classify them in, in my mind, I've heard are kind of direct HR line positions. So if you are a chair, mm. a dean, a provost, or a president, then you are directly involved in the annual assessment of faculty um, mm. and staff for a particular unit, as opposed to, uh, so in those situations, you're, you're responsible for people oh. and non-HR line roles, um, those usually start with the words you know, assistant or associate in front of them, mm -hmm. then you're in charge of programs uh, more mm -hmm. so than, than people. You need to work with people to make those programs successful. And oftentimes it can be even more challenging because you're not completing their annual evaluations. You must use your powers of persuasion mm -hmm. um, to can, can convince those individuals that it's in their best interest and the college's best interest um, to work together on a particular initiative but it's a very different, um, your timelines are different and those two types of roles um, and, and, uh, and, and generally the strategies and tools that you need for success are different in those types of roles. So it's important, I think, to understand uh, your, your own self, the skills that you bring to the table and then how that fits into that particular position. The key is don't, don't if you love the title, but you don't love the duties of the job, you're gonna hate the job. And we right. say that to our sport management students all the time, don't we? Right. You know, we, when, when everybody shows up and says, oh, I want to be a sports agent or I want to be a general manager, or, I want to be an athletic director. We always remind them that it's don't fall in love with the title, fall in love with the duties of the job. And mm -hmm. if you find the duties of the job are what attract you, then you're going to be successful in that position. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. So can you talk about um, this job that you have now, what challenges you're facing? But if you want to talk about something that stands out to you from another position, um, I'd definitely be interested in hearing that too. Okay. Uh, well, at FSU, they had you know, hired a search firm uh, to find their next dean of the College of Education. The search firm really helped them uh, create a full position a description document mm. that and, and profile for the job that actually included five different opportunities and challenges that they had 
um, outlined, and uh, I've actually found those to be very accurate and true and representative of what the experience has been like here. So I'll run through those five and then yeah. talk a little bit about what we've done to try to address those. So mm -hmm. the first challenge uh, here in the College of Education at FSU was increasing visibility and national rankings. Mm -hmm. So the job description said, you know, the Dean of the College of Education will join both a college and a university on an upward trajectory. He or she will be committed to pursuing new opportunities for excellence. Mm -hmm. The college seeks to increase its visibility, impact, and national rankings and attract high quality faculty, students, and staff. The dean will cultivate existing partnerships and establish new ones to enhance the college's impact on education in the state of Florida nationally. And in Florida, um, those U.S. News and World Report rankings are particularly important uh, to us because they actually play a role in our uh, state funding that we receive from the from the legislature each year. And so uh, the challenge, I think, for the College of Education was trying to find a way to in increase our ranking and um, in the past uh, few years, we've gone up 19 places in the rankings. We're now number 18 among public universities, which is uh, our, our best ever. It broke a record that had stood in the college for 27 years. Um, and then in addition to that, we've had a couple of uh, academic programs actually vault to the number one ranking in their field for mm -hmm. the first time. And so that's that's helped us out a lot in that regard. Uh, the second major challenge that they had identified was increasing research productivity. So, and more specifically, they, they had stated that the dean will step into an organization well poised to build upon strengths and identify new areas for enhancing academic research partnerships at the university. Mm -hmm. Housed within the College of Education is an effective office of research dedicated to supporting the college's faculty and students. The dean will be committed to furthering the efforts to increase research funding and serve as a champion and catalyst for interdisciplinary research and collaborative opportunities. And I certainly found that to be true when I came in. Uh, and I've done this with all three of my deanships. I made a commitment to meet with every single faculty and staff member individually during the first year for at least a half an hour to an hour yeah. to learn more about their personal and professional background, what their experience has been like at the college, um, what types of things that we could be doing better to support them in their, in their role. And when I got to FSU and met with a lot of the faculty, Many of them, the recurring theme was we have an amazing office of research that's doing mm -hmm. such a great job in helping us out. Mm -hmm. In addition to having pre and post award uh, budget support for grants, uh, we also have our own editor that helps edit proposals here uh, full time and uh, they just do a fantastic job and the, the, the grant funding in the college has actually been increasing we're up to uh, this year we have. Uh, the year that we just completed, we had $49.4 million of active grant funding uh, in the college, which was an all-time high for the college. So we've, we've continued that upward trajectory over the past few years. The third area that they identified as a big challenge was student recruitment and enrollment management. Uh, they said the dean will attend to the growth, retention, and successful graduation of students within the College of Education. Uh -huh. The dean must provide a clear vision and fervent voice for the college for and fulfilling its mission to make a significant impact on the lives of students, not only in the state of Florida, but nationally. The dean will also play a significant role in the identification and development of new revenue sources to increase the level of financial support for graduate students in order to attract and retain the best and brightest of the college. So the college had, had gone through a period of, of annual declines in enrollment uh, mm -hmm. almost 10 consecutive years by the time that I arrived in 2018. Wow. And um, we've turned that around significantly. Uh, our, our graduate student headcount has now gone up uh, by 37%. And that's helped us actually on the, on the recruitment. I think those um, rankings have helped us as well. We now have more than double the number of applications coming into the college for graduate um, uh, seats in our program than we did just a few years ago. And so mm -hmm. there's that challenge, I think we've been working hard to address. You know, another challenge I identified was academic diversity. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make sure the Dean was um, possessing a genuine interest in working with college faculty and will serve as a strong advocate for all programs and departments in the college, uh, not mm -hmm. just one or two. Mm -hmm. um, and at this stage, all of our departments in the college have now received new faculty lines and the college has had um, 17 new faculty lines since 2018, along mm -hmm. with retaining all of our uh, vacated lines as they occurred with retirements and so forth. And then the final challenge that they identified was community engagement. They really wanted the dean to lead 
that effort for the college's work. And, and I found that when I met with members of the community and, and um, state leaders, they, they knew that we were doing a lot of great research here. They just weren't really sure how it connected to them and benefited uh, the average uh, you know, uh, oh. teacher or principal or superintendent in the state. Yeah. And so we launched a new initiative called Product Elevate Ed uh, to recruit, train, and retain K-12 education professionals. And oh. we've been doing a lot of work with that. We've delivered care packages to all FSU graduates who are currently teaching in the state of Florida. We're, we're doing that right now and equipping them with tools to recruit the next generation of teachers. Uh -huh. um, usually, uh, you know, the first profession that a student is actually encounters in society is usually a teacher. And, and uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when you ask young children what they want to be when they grow up, teacher was the number is consistently the number one answer. These days, when you do that same survey, actually professional athlete is the yes. number one answer. <clears throat> I've heard that a uh, lot. Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, uh, it's, it's, um, that tells us that if we're in a college of education waiting until students are in their high school years to try to recruit them into a teaching program, way too late. You know, we've already lost them. So we're partnering with our alumni uh, mm -hmm. to reach out and equip them with tools to, to really tap, some, but tap those students on the shoulder that they think would be great teachers and plant mm -hmm. that seed in their mind. Mm -hmm. That often means so much to an impressionable um, youth as they're growing up. We've yeah. also es established a lot of new programs, six new graduate programs, three graduate certificates, six combined bachelor's, master's programs, mm. and uh, specifically in that area, while also expanding support for some of our existing programs that prepare education professionals. We've um, started, we started a new tradition here at FSU of recognizing award-winning education professionals from around the state uh, at Bobby Bowden Field during home football games annually. Mm. And we've scaled this initiative to include the other public universities in the state of Florida and to members of the ACC, the Atlantic Coast Conference, our athletic conference. Yeah. Uh, we, we started granting a three year, a full three year graduate tuition waiver to every mm -hmm. Florida Teacher of the Year Award recipient in the state. Mm -hmm. And so far, we've done this for three years and all three have enrolled in, in graduate programs in our college. And you know, you look 10, 15 years down the line, yeah. you're gonna see Florida Teachers of the Year who graduated from a lot of different undergraduate institutions, but their terminal degree will. Um, be from Florida State, and it's a great, yeah. a great sign for the oldest college of education to step up and and make a commitment like that. We've gotten a lot of donors that have gotten very interested in Product Elevate Ed. We've now had 14 different new scholarships that have been created just for pre-service teachers, mm -hmm. and we've awarded 1.81 million dollars in scholarships to College of Education students just since 2018. We've launched two different fundraising platforms for Florida's public education colleges in the state. One is named Dual of the Schools, designed for two education programs to um, use their natural rivalries between their athletic programs to raise funding for each other. And then the Elevate Ed Giving Challenge, which we'll be going uh, into within the next a few days, actually, mm. and helping to raise money across all education programs in the state of Florida. We provided professional development for over 2,000 teachers since 2018. We've prepared almost 700 uh, graduates for successful careers in K through 12 education since then. Mm -hmm. And we've successfully advocated for some statewide education policies that provided significant raises and salary increases for mm -hmm. teachers across Florida in the 2020 and 2021 legislative sessions. So those were the main challenges and how we tried yeah. to go about and, and address those. And yeah. Um, was there anything, so this is what you were tasked with. So then we had a pandemic hit in 2020. Can you talk a little bit about how that impacted any of those initiatives or if there were any um, hidden challenges, those that you didn't expect, you know, that were about something else um, other than what you were tasked with doing? Sure, and the pandemic affected us in, in many ways. For example, delivering our care packages to teachers across the state. Um, we had to stop that temporarily. Uh, we eventually did it. We suspended it for about six months or so. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to get back into the schools, but the schools weren't even really letting you know, our students coming in to do uh, their learning experiences. And, right. and so there were some big challenges, I think, with, with that aspect of it. Um, also, because one of the number one ranked programs uh, that our college has is instructional systems and learning technologies. So mm -hmm. basically providing leadership for online uh, course delivery. So suddenly, uh, you know, our college had a very big spotlight on it in a positive way, but a very sudden spotlight. 
right. on how best for our faculty here at FSU to pivot and work in remote environments. And, yeah. and so it, it, it caused us to, it, it highlighted certain areas of the college and caused us to pivot in certain ways. And then in other ways, we didn't have too much impact and, and, and other aspects of it, but it was, uh, it, it was very different. Um, and in many ways, I'm actually hoping that the pandemic is going to be uh, a positive for education colleges across the country. If you look at uh, teacher prep programs in particular, enrollment over the past 10 years is down about 30% nationwide. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of that has to just do with perceptions about what teaching careers are like these days. Yeah. In some states, certainly salaries have not kept up with um, what, what they should have been. And so mm-hmm. as, as a result, you haven't had as many students move into that direction, but we also have a very socially active uh, group of incoming students that are very aware of things that are going on in society. They're looking at how they're going to make their impact on society and the world at, at large. And, and being a teacher where you're really preparing future generations of leaders is a great way to do that. And I think that in many ways, uh, the average American quickly learned uh, exactly how much a teacher brings to the table every single huh. day when they had to do homeschooling for their kids and yes, and trying to keep everything in line. And they learned a lot about classroom management and, <laughs> and the job, the job quickly, you quickly realize, wait a second, this is a profession. This isn't just something you can oh, pick yeah. up by reading the back of a napkin. No, so, um, it's, it's, I think it's actually going to be good for education colleges um, across the country as as different forms of you know state and and national government uh, take a closer look at teaching and what what we need to be doing here in the United States to make sure that we're preparing the next generation the best that we can. Yeah, and maybe kids will start to pick teacher as their profession that they want to be rather than professional athlete. That would yeah. be fantastic. Yeah. So if you are talking to faculty or um, other individuals who um, you are you come across who are interested in becoming uh, a dean at some point or even provost or president, et cetera, what kinds of advice or words of wisdom would you give to them based on your own experiences? Well, I have a lot that I can pass along in this area. I mean, yeah. some that's been passed along to me and some that I've learned uh, the hard way, but certainly first and foremost would be learn as much as you can about higher education administration before taking the leap. Again, something I did not do. <laughs> um, but uh, so don't don't do as I do <laughs> right. as I now. But um, you know, universities are not particularly good with onboarding academic leaders, nor are we very good at succession planning mm. um, sometimes. And all too often, that leads to new administrations or new administrators being thrown on the job with little to no training, um, yet being asked to deliver results almost instantaneously. Yeah. Uh, so there are some really good sources out there uh, and uh, different groups and societies that have come along the way. I, I uh, joined the American Association of University Administrators back in 2010, 2011, I believe, maybe even a little bit earlier than that. And that group is comprised of you know deans, provosts, presidents, but but even department chairs, program coordinators around the country, um, all the way from, you know, a community college level to a a research one institution level. And that group meets once a year, uh, but then also has programming throughout the year. And I've learned, I think it's important to have mentors, not just inside your institution, but outside your institution, because there's Mm. sometimes you're going to run into issues where you really need to talk to somebody outside of your institution to get the best advice. Right. Um, so, but but learning as much as you can about it would certainly be priority number one. Number two, I, I alluded to earlier, which was make sure you're passionate about the job duties and not the job title. We right. we tell that all the time to our sport management students. Those same principles apply to higher education administration. If you like the sound of the title, but you don't like the duties of the job, you're not going to like the job. Right. I think third, um, definitely be prepared to lose autonomy and flexibility when moving into administration. Hmm. So um, in today's hyper-connected world, your constituents want high quality interaction very, very quickly. And yes. that may not align perfectly with your preferred work schedule each day. Right. So just understand that uh, when you move into administration, you're really, you're really more moving into a, a structured work environment. And then sometimes um, you know, the mission of the college doesn't, doesn't just stop nine to five every day. You have to be prepared to 
um, provide support when you need when needed, uh, sometimes after hours. And that's a big that's a big jump. And a lot of faculty aren't willing to make that commitment. And that's one of the main reasons why they don't move into administration. That's completely fine. Yeah. Um, I think uh, certainly knowing the difference, as I mentioned earlier, between HR line positions like a chair, dean, provost, and a president right. versus a non-HR line positions, the assistant or associate positions are real important. Um, and, and knowing what skills you need to have for each one of those. Um, next would be learning to embrace change and challenges. I mean, I think all of us can relate to times in life when we just wanted the status quo. Yeah. But in higher education administration, we're called upon to seek out positive changes mm -hmm. to continuously uh, uh, improve systems in ways that will benefit faculty, staff, and students. Mm -hmm. um, so also along those lines, I would say rather than avoiding challenges and procrastinating when facing conflict, it is better to just expect challenge daily and to embrace challenge. And yes. that's a, a different paradigm, but one that... Um, I think has over time served me well is to is to look forward. Those challenges are opportunities for improvement that are that are screaming at you every single day when you walk in. And so yeah. expect them, embrace them, and they're only going to make you better as you as you work to try to accomplish them. And then, you know, lastly, I'd certainly say seek out good mentors. I think that there's actually in sport management, I actually think we have an advantage because I think there's quite a few similarities. I've certainly found a lot of similarities between sport management and higher education. Uh, administration. For example, you know, both have an outcome that is not fully known prior to purchase. So one can learn about a sport event in advance, advance by maybe looking at win-loss records, studying team performance and matchups or betting odds, yeah. just like one can learn about higher education institutions by examining various ranking systems or graduation rates. But the exact outcome is not known at the time of financial commitment to purchase in both sport and in higher education. Right. <laughs> you know, and second, actually, you know, the purchase entity in both of those uh, instances is truly intangible. So while one may receive a tangible ticket mm -hmm. or a tangible diploma to put up on the wall like this one up here, yes. um, you know, what is truly important to the consumer is the experience behind that ticket or diploma. Yes. And that experience is what drives the satisfaction not the paper ticket or the diploma itself. Okay. And then finally, I think uh, you know, sport experiences and higher education, both they're both perishable entities. So sport teams cannot sell empty seats after the contest ends. Mm -hmm. um, just like in higher education, you can't sell classroom seats after the drop ed deadline is passed for the semester. So right. I actually think that there's a, a identical good deal of transfer yeah. between uh, sport management and higher education management, uh, certainly more than most other disciplines in the academy. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I did. I'm glad you said that because I was going to follow up just a little bit. Um, if there was anything specific for sport management faculty or students, you know, who are interested in pursuing this. And it sounds like you gave me, you know, gave that information already. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that there's there's great potential for I'm kind of surprised that we don't have more sport management faculty that have moved into administration as a result of that, just because I I, and it may just be the intimidation of it. It may just be not wanting to give up and conform to that nine to five schedule. There, there are gonna be lots of different reasons. There's also, whenever there's a, a relatively new um, discipline in the academy, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes there can be a, a little bit of a glass ceiling for moving into administrative okay. positions. You know, the old nice. saying, people in power tend to do whatever they need to do to remain in power. And right. um, if they're not open to having, I think the sign of any healthy college um, is that an individual from any one of the disciplines in the college could eventually be selected and move into um, a dean position or somewhere along those lines. So right. um, there's, there may be some places still where sport management's not treated the same way as, as other disciplines, right. but uh, I actually see a lot of commonalities and connection between sport management and higher education administration, and I, mm -hmm. I call it my secret weapon. It's actually been yeah. a, a great benefit for me. Right. Yeah. And I wonder at what point sport management will not be the new discipline. Um, you know, how many years need to go by for that? That's true. Because what are we at 50 or 60 right now? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I guess it's the first one. But I mean, we really weren't uh, getting lots of programs starting to populate until the 90s. But yeah. but still, yes, I, I've, I've learned over time that all sport management reputation is local. You know, <laughs> and, uh, so uh, in fact, I had worked at University of Louisville and University of Tennessee, both who had very good 
sport management programs and doctoral programs there. But yeah. when I got to Troy University, I, I realized actually the sport management program there had a very, very strong reputation on campus. But if you looked at in individuals, they had a, a dean of another college who had a background in sport management and they had a vice chancellor of another campus within that system. Hmm. Um, ironically, both of them and myself all got our PhDs at Florida State. Um, but as a result of having individuals that were in senior administration who had those degrees and said good things about them and yes. and did good things, uh, all of a sudden that that discipline was very well respected on campus as a result. So it's yes. it's important to not just look at, I mean, a university's ranking is not going to have any uh, correlation to how sport management as a program might be perceived on campus. And I think that's another important thing to, to look at when you're looking at administrative positions and mm -hmm. various places. Is, is there a base of support in your discipline uh, to, to serve as a foundation for your administrative career? Yeah, agreed, agreed. Do you have any final comments you want to make or any points you want to make for the listeners? Um, you know, just that I hope that um, more sport management scholars will um, you know, seriously consider and, and pursue opportunities in sport management and mm -hmm. to, to move into higher education administration. I think that um, we're, if you look at the size of our program, certainly a faculty and staff, uh, but then look at the number of individuals who have moved into administration, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's under, we're underrepresented, I think, overall in, in the academy. And it, it really doesn't need to be that way. Like I said, I think we actually have a, a great opportunity um, to move forward. And the programs like you're doing right now, Heather, is actually a, a great service, I think, for those who are considering to maybe dip their toe into administration to learn a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm certainly happy to, if anyone wants to reach out to me and has any specific questions over time, I'm, I'm always happy to help out anyone in any way that I can um, if they're interested in, in learning more. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, I agree with you. I think this series is interesting. And then the sessions we're going to have at our conference in February will um, be another way for um, students and faculty to learn more about what it means to be in an administrative position. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with me today, Dr. Andrew. And uh, thank you so much for being here and for all of your good advice. Happy to do it, Heather. And thank you for all you're doing for Cosma. You're welcome. Yeah.